So Jaibhim and uh, Namo Buddha to all of you. Uh, this is our 32nd uh, class on the Buddha and his Dhamma. And uh, we are at the moment studying the uh, volume uh, three, uh, book three and part uh, four of, uh, of, of this book. And uh, here we are looking at what is not Dhamma. And so far we have covered about five uh, chapters. And today we are going to look at the sixth chapter, which is titled as belief based on speculation is not Dhamma. And as always, this uh, topic of what is not Dhamma is very crucial for understanding the uh, scheme of Baba Sahib Ambedkar when he has wrote this monumental book in which he has tried to clear a lot of grounds for us. And I think this schematic uh, sort of representation of what is not Dhamma is very, very helpful to us for many, uh, on many counts. One of the things is that we can clearly know what is not Dhamma and we can uh, easily uh, then come uh, to understanding what is the Dhamma and what is the Sadhamma. So uh, let's look at it. Uh, uh, this look at this chapter today. But before we begin, uh, we we'll, uh, let's recite Namo Tassa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa. So the uh, chapter is titled as Belief Based on Speculation is Not Dhamma. The uh, title of the chapter is very clear because it goes on uh, stating in a very clear terms what is not Dhamma. So there is, of course, no scope for any speculation when it comes to Dhamma. Because the Buddha, as we, we have seen, and we will see that often he talked about the uh, uh, anything, we cannot just believe anything. We have to examine it, we have to explore it, and then only we can we can understand something. And here, any sort of speculative thinking, any sort of things that leads to what we can call in the Buddhist terms, in terms of flamboyant speculations. You know, sometimes our speculations are so flamboyant, flamboyant that they lead us to astray. And therefore, the Buddha has guarded against uh, uh, this uh, speculative thinking. So all of us, and in you know, in 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 it's very common in the world to raise these questions. So the question is like, was I in the ages past? Means did I exist in the past? Was I in ages past? A very important question that you know is very speculative, very flamboyant. And whenever this discussion comes, our our minds are naturally drawn to the questions. Was I not in ages past? Was I there or was I not? What was I then? If I was there, then what was I then? From what did I pass to what? You know, what was I? From what I passed to what? Shall I be in ages to come? Shall I not be in ages to come? What shall I then be? So in the future, what shall I? I, I, I then be? So, shall I then be? so like this, this, there are these questions like this. How shall I then be? From what shall I pass to what? Or again, is it self today about which he is in doubt? Asking himself, am I? Am I not? What am I? How am I? Whence came my being? Whither will it pass? Mm -hmm. So you see this, all these questions have something very common between them that they, these questions are about I, self, Secondly, these questions are about the past and the questions are about future. And you know how I came to pass from this to that. These are the questions that are there all the time about self or I. These are very interesting questions. They are very, as uh, you know, some of the scholars say, very flamboyant questions. And these questions are so flamboyant 
that they draw our attention out immediately and leads to the speculative thinking because all the time we are thinking about what i was and what i shall be the buddha said that the the past and the future is very difficult to penetrate at this moment because the past is already gone the future is yet to arrive so the buddha's teaching begins with the present moment and we have seen that there are a lot of things a lot of teachers who talk about the present moment but here what buddha is saying is that the reality whatever that is is unfolding before us and the way to understand anything begins with understanding of what buddha called shalayatan six senses okay now the six senses that we experience they have certain immediacy to the six senses uh, senses uh, senses for example eyes we see in the present when we open our eyes we see in the present when we listen to something it is happening in the present time when we smell something it happens in the present time when we taste something when we touch something so these traditional five senses and then there is also the six sense sense which in the buddhism called mana so mana is a is a sense where all these different channels which brings the different stimuli are integrated and are known by some symbols by some what what is called percept or percept what is called the percept so and then you know the, the percept leads to concepts and then there is in the buddhist uh, terminology it is called the prapancha proliferation of the conceptual world okay so these questions which are very flamboyant they draw our attention out about past and future because we always like to think about where we come from and where we are going but the buddha says hold on for a bit the past is already gone the future has not yet come just pay attention to your senses and see what is happening around you so for example there are shalayatan six aitans six bases of experiences and then there is so called world but whatever out there is always sensed or mediated by our senses so buddha says that there is no problem in the perception so long as we do not crave after what is emerging in this ocean of senses buddha gives a very beautiful example of the ocean ocean of eyes ocean of ears ocean of uh, tongue ocean of uh, smell ocean of touch you know these are all things it's like a ocean when we look at the world around through our eyes which is a dominant sense we see up to the sky we see up to long distances we see the mountains up there if it is a clear sky or a clear day but so long as we don't crave after the what is emerging in this oceanic oceanic uh, senses we do not suffer so the point here is about having this discussion and the questions that uh, you know that are there which we all ask all the time about who i am and where i was going the simple answer in the buddhist buddhist terminology is this that however hard we try to find i it's very difficult to find however hard we try so where can we find the reality we can find the reality or experience the reality where it's happening right now and it's happening at our sense doors it's happening at between the contact of our eyes and the whatever out there 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 outside us and you know this outside inside is just the way of speaking because this experience is just emerge if we open the eyes we cannot but 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 see when we have when we open our ears we cannot but listen when we touch something we cannot but you know feel that touch when we have a consciousness it cannot but think of certain objects the man man cannot stand without thinking about certain objects both internal objects and external objects 
so these are the questions that were there and very speculative in nature instead of that buddha would buddha would teach us to cut through the speculation and and be aware of what is happening right now with you then as regard the universe various questions were raised some of them were as follows how was the universe created very interesting questions we all like to think about it speculate about it how was the universe created is it everlasting is it going to last forever so these questions have been answered by some of the uh, speculative philosophies of the time saying that everything was created by brahma others said it was created by prajapati and we know that all religions speculate about these questions they all have the what is called the uh, uh, story of genesis as to how the world came into existence the bible has it the quran has it and all the religions have it answer to the second question some said it was everlasting some said the question is or you know this everlasting other said it was not some said it was finite other said it was finite so you see there are all these speculative views about uh, what is called the uh, uh, you know the, the 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 about the universe how was the universe created how you know whether it's everlasting and all these things these questions the buddha refused to entertain the buddha refused to entertain any of this question and there is a very beautiful uh, uh, pali text called malukya putta sutta where malukya goes to the buddha and he asks these speculative questions very plain point speculative questions to the buddha and the buddha gives him a example of a man who is hit by an arrow and he is lying on the cross road and he is in the emergency he needs immediate medical attention but then people are there who are you know instead of taking him to the hospital or 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 you know looking after him they speculate about the nature of the arrow whether the arrow was uh, you know uh, uh, what was the substance that arrow was made of whether it was made from the metal from the wood what kind of poison they are used in the arrow then who was the shooter whether he was from this class or that class so the buddha says that these questions are forensic in nature they might not help the poor man who is being killed by the arrow and likewise buddha says that this all speculations are you are you this are or these all speculations are never going to help the human beings so instead what buddha says am i audible there yes yes, yes. you are audible yes so what the buddha says that you know we 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 cannot look go after this uh, uh, you know flame point questions we cannot go for the questions which doesn't matter he says that the, what matters is the dukkha that is emerging all the time because if you are you if we are going after or craving after something it's eventually going to lead to the suffering so buddha says i only teach two things the dukkha and the end of the dukkha so all this flamboyant speculation questions the buddha denied to answer because they do not contribute to the end of suffering even if we know the answer to the questions it will not lead to the end of our suffering for example you know there are there are now a lot of theories coming about the universe there are more complex theories there are more mathematical theories and so on and so forth but they don't eventually lead to eradicate human suffering and buddha said these are wrong questions and uh, in in pali there are uh, there are very good uh, sentences about it but here baba sahib ambedkar has has translated it very beautifully in the verse number 6 this questions the buddha refused to entertain he said that they could only be asked and entertained by wrong headed people this questions can only be asked and entertained by the wrong headed people so if we are if we are if we are doing physics if we are doing chemistry if we are doing any astrophysics this questions might be useful about the origin of universe how it was created but when it comes to a domain of eradicating the human suffering 
these questions have no consequence. And in the seventh verse, to answer these questions required only science, which nobody had. And the eighth verse is very interesting. He said that he was not omniscient enough to answer these questions. Now people will think that, you know, the Buddha was omniscient or not, because this is a question. This, this question is asked in million prashna, whether the Buddha was omniscient. So of course, Buddha knew what was to be known. Of course, the Buddha knew what was to be known in terms of eradicating the suffering of the humanity. And there is a very beautiful sutta in, in, in Buddhism called Simpasa Sutta, where the Buddha picks up the handful of the leaves from the forest and he asks the monks whether the leaves in his hands are more or the leaves in the forest. And Bhikkhu says that the leaves in his hands are more, are, are less than compared to the leaves in the forest. So he says that whatever you need are just these leaves. You don't need forest. And what is this? what are these leaves? The Four Noble Truths. So as a Buddhist, even if we can understand, even if we can practice, even if we can realize the Four Noble Truths, that's enough. Instead of, you know, uh, leading to the speculative philosophies. So the Buddha was, of course, omniscient in terms of knowing the Dhamma. He knew the nature of word as it is. But in terms of these questions, no one could claim to know all that is to be known, nor what we wish to know at any time is known at the time. There is always something that is unknown. Because you see this, the, the way the time flows, there will be always something to know. There will be always something that we don't know, that the humanity doesn't know. It is for these reasons that the Buddha excluded such doctrines from his religion. He regarded a religion which made such doctrines a part of it as a religion not worth having. So he said indulging in this speculative thinking is not really being religious. And the part two more or less goes into the same things, the same questions, the doctrines with which the contemporaries of the Buddha had made the basis of the religion were concerned with self and the origin of the universe. So only two questions, self and the origin of the universe. They raised certain questions about the self. They asked, was I in ages past? Was I not in ages past? What was I then? From what did I pass to what? Shall I be in ages to come? Shall I not be in ages to come? What shall I then be? How shall I then be? From what I shall, from what shall I pass to what? Or again, is it self today, which he is in doubt asking himself, am I? Am I not? What am I? How am I? Whence came my being? Whither will it, whither will it pass? So these, these questions, the Buddha, 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 Buddha told that they are asked by the wrong-headed people. They don't contribute to the end of suffering of the people, of the human beings. Other is the questions regarding the origin of the universe. Some said it was created by Brahma. Others said it was, it was created by Prajapati sacrificing himself. Then there were other teachers had other questions to raise. The word is everlasting. Some of them said that the word is everlasting. The word is not everlasting. Some said the word is not everlasting. Some said the world is infinite. Some said the world is finite. The body is the life. Some said the body is life. The body is the one thing and the life another. Then truth finder exists after death. Tathagata exists after death. A truth finder does not exist after death. He both exists and does not exist after death. He neither exists nor does not exist after death. Now this uh, last set of four is called in Buddhism Tetralema. And then we have seen that the philosophers like Nagarjuna and all they have gone into the depth of these questions. And proving that, you know, they, these, these, these things cannot be established. Coming to the conclusion that there is nothing to hold on to. They talked about sunya, emptiness. Striping everything of this speculative thinking. The Buddhist realized, the Buddha realized that there is nothing to speculate about. The, uh, there is no atta, so there is nothing to speculate about atta. 
because buddha realized that it you know there is you know it's anatta and as a consequence the buddha realized paticca samutpa he realized the interconnectedness of everything and therefore these questions didn't matter these questions were just in the realm of speculation so the buddhist philosopher afterwards have gone into this what is called the tetralemma it exists the tetralemma goes like this the first lemma goes like this it exists it doesn't exist it both exists and does not exist it neither exists nor does not exist and so when this was applied to anything in the world it it really it 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 it, 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 it concluded into absurdity and there are a number of examples if you are interested if we want to study it further you know there is nagarjuna's text where he talks about you know he this uh, uh, insufficiency of this questions to understand anything in the world so these were the questions which the buddha said could be asked by wrong headed persons so the buddha said that these are the questions which can only be asked by the wrong headed person and that was the buddha's take on this now there are three reasons why the buddha condemned these religious theories the first there was no reason to make them part of religion why we should make these theories the part of the religion this origin of the universe and you know all this uh, thing can be the part of the you know the the so called the domain of science where the scientists are doing their best to understand the world why it should be you know why all the religions should try to explain the origin of the world every religion is trying to explain the origin of the world how the world came into being you know there is a controversy in 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 the biblical way of thinking because the bible doesn't believe in in evolution it be believe believes in creation and uh, there is a lot of uh, controversy always goes on in the in the in the in the american schools about whether the evolution should be taught or the biblical version of the creation should be taught same thing is happening in our country today that the people are trying to bring religion in the domain of science saying trying to say that india had uh, plastic surgery and you know the, the the aeroplanes were flying in the air and what not now how this can be the domain of the religion and i think this is a very important question so we also as a buddhist should be very wary of this as to what is the purpose of our religion the purpose of our religion is to understand the suffering and end the suffering full stop we buddhist doesn't have to go into speculative thinking let the people do their job if some of us are interested in science they can very well pursue this question but they cannot be the part of the religion and if the religions are trying to encroach upon those territories of science then it's not healthy it is always going to lead to more and more and more and more speculative thinking so in the first place there was no reason to make them part of religion what is the logic there to believe that the people are originating from the mouth of the so called brahma how then that can be the part of the religion so these questions speculative questions have no scope in 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 the religion as such and if anybody is trying to put these things in the religion is actually leading the masses to the blind alley in the second place to answer this question required omni science which nobody had he emphasized this in his addresses there is still so much to know for the human beings we are just beginning to know certain things if we talk about the human knowledge in terms of understanding the human beings before us they didn't know that the earth was was spherical or earth was what is called geoid they thought that the earth was flat they thought that the sky is just a few uh, miles away from the earth but now 
when we, when the science is advancing in this area we know that this earth is just a tiny speck in the universe not even a tiny speck the speck of a speck in the universe there were a lot of speculations about the, where the human beings have come from and the evolutionary theories have proved beyond doubt that we we have evolved we we were just didn't never drop from certain certain heaven and there is a conclusive evidence based theory which proves that the evolution is true buddha never believed in any creationism he said that there cannot be a creator god and the buddha create buddha buddha explained that with the logic the buddha talked about the immensurability of time because you know buddha understood through his logic that the time cannot be measured measured just like that the buddha found that this conceptual world is relative what is true here might not be true there what is true right now might not be true in another context i can be hungry at this moment next moment i cannot be hungry so the point is that to answer these questions required omni science which nobody had he emphasized this in his addresses and the 11th verse is very profound he said that at one and the same time no one can know and see everything one cannot know and see everything it's not possible to see everything it's not possible to know everything he emphasized knowledge is never final you see that's a very 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 interesting see we all the religion tend to go towards certain ideal certain ideal form that's already there and we have to attain it as if the goal is certain as it as if the goal of the humanity is certain definite it is going to lead to the hell or heaven the buddha says no the first doctrine the buddha taught is anicca not always so we don't know what is going to happen we don't know what kind of the world is going to be there we don't know we are not certain and this quest for certainty is always there because it gives some kind of a satisfaction to human being that we always try to crave for some certainty but the buddha said no the world is uncertain we don't know what is going what is there out we don't know what kind of the world there will be nobody knows nobody knew that we will be entering in a world which will be dominated by so much of a social media and the consciousness that it leads to knowledge is never final there is always something more to be known the third argument against these theories was that they were merely speculative they are not verified nor are they verifiable it's very profound some of the things like for example atma or atta it's very speculative to think about atta because you know when we think about the the the, the nama rupa theory or the reality of the body and mind it doesn't need any atta to function there cannot be anything independent of our body and mind there cannot be something which never changes because the thing that never changes cannot come into being it's not possible so any talk on atta or any talk on certainty it is all speculative because we have seen through our experiences you know by just being you know aware of our present bodies and minds and the senses we can begin to know that it's not there is nothing permanent there is nothing that we can hold on to there is nothing even certain in terms of what we are going to think next so coming back to so coming back to what is uh, uh, you know the uh, buddha's objection buddha said that third argument against this theories was that they were merely speculative 
they are not verified nor are they verifiable they were the result of imagination let loose they were the result of the imagination let loose so you see that the imaginations sometimes they they produce a compound effect which has the power to draw us out into a realm that doesn't help the human beings so all these Im imaginative theories all these speculative theories all that is not verified we should be very wary of and we will leave it there where it belongs to the domain of science to the domain of you know whatever we shouldn't try to you know answer those questions through the so called religious way because they are not part of the religion and baba sambedkar has made it clear what is religion in you know in the in the succeeding chapters what is the purpose of the dhamma besides so what good were these speculative theories to man in his relation to man very important there are so many theories about god and all but how does that contribute to the relationship of one human being with another human being for example look at this concept of brahmanism everybody is brahma everybody has a brahma but how does that translate into the social reality into caste system you know god is all merciful we are all sons and daughters of the god what happens in the world the people kill each other in the name of the religion so this speculative theories what good they do to the human beings nothing they don't have any say on how one human being to uh, should relate with another human being and of course the the the, the 15th verse hits at where it should be hit the buddha did not believe that the world was created he believed that the world had evolved and it's going to get evolved it's not going to remain where it is the world is going to undergo evolution it is going to transform it is going to change it is going to manifest into all different forms we don't know we cannot speculate and this speculation is not going to help our with the suffering that we experience today so looking at this particular chapter 6 which baba sambet ke titled it as belief based on speculation is not dhamma so anything that is not based on the fact of suffering and the removal of suffering and how that suffering comes into being how that suffering arises and what are the ways to end the suffering what is the path to end the suffering that is the purpose of the dhamma nothing else so the buddha in so many pali suttas has not entertained any speculative thinking he has not entertained the speculative thinking of vachaputta he has not entertained the speculative thinking of malukyaputta he called them mogapurisha he said these are not the questions that i told you that i will answer there is a story of one of the buddha's disciple uh, who wanted to you know indulge into speculation and he couldn't find the answer to the questions like what is the end of the world what is the beginning of the world so he went to the buddha and said you are not answering this question the buddha asked him you know stupid man did i ever claim that i will answer these questions buddha never did claim that he will answer this question about the origin of the but he can he can through his experience can tell very surely very concretely that the world is not created nothing is created in the world the things evolve it is the nature of the world evolution is the essence of the world they evolve and evolve this cyclic things going on all the time sankhara vatta sankhara in pali text it is called vatta means cyclic sankhara the sankhara is the reality of the world everything is conditioned in the world even our our bodies are conditioned they arise because of the fact of the pachayata the causes and conditions and even those causes and conditions are impermanent 
So we are living in a cyclic world which arises and passes away. In our own sensual experiences, which we see that all the time certain things are arising and passing away. Once they arise and pass away, there is uh, there is a calmness. Then again the things arise and pass away. Just like that, dukkha arises and passes away. But we are so much conditioned by by this ignorance that the dukkha arises all the time, and we don't realize the possibilities of the end of suffering. So, I think this the way Baba Sambedkar has 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 structured this part four in terms of what is not dhamma, in terms of uh, the various chapters. And today we looked at the chapter number six. Which looks very ordinary from the beginning, from the face of it. But if we go deeply into it, if we try to study it, we begin to see the value of it. We begin to see that you know why the Buddha avoided the speculative thinking, speculative questions, speculative philosophies, and too much of an imaginative, imaginative thinking. So with this, we will I will I will just stop here and open up the class for the discussion. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Dr. Sunanda here. Ah. Uh, you have explained it so well and so nicely. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you are really uh, making us realize uh, what Buddha has said. And uh, as you know, that uh, we are in our day to day life or in uh, this thing, we are uh, experiencing a nature told by Buddha. So whatever you have uh, explained today, it goes uh, more towards the anicca. Am I right? Yes, anicca, anatta, and of course, dukkha. Uh, 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 so these are the uh, truth which uh, um, uh, Buddha has said. And uh, we are experiencing it. I think everybody has experienced. Only thing we have to understand that what we are experiencing. And then uh, we can definitely realize the importance of it. Thank you so much. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, uh, may I request you to focus uh, uh, on 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 the uh, uh, verse number uh, eleven. Verse number eleven. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I think uh, and and you have related the uh, word six sentences. Hmm. And uh, six senses. Six, six senses. Yeah, yeah. Six senses. Sadhyata. Something like like sadhyata. Can okay. be related. Means, means uh, uh, Buddha has said that uh, uh, it is not uh, 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 possible to, uh, to answer to these questions. Means not possible means uh, no use. And yes. For, for for this answer of Buddha, it's of no use. Have a concrete ground on which this this these words has been told. Hmm. And and that uh, means I am confusing. Uh, I am confused with the uh, with these words and eleven verse number. This eleven, no, he said that at one and the same time, no one can know and see everything. So you see, the act of knowing begins with act act of seeing, right? Right, sir. So we have to enter into the domain of theory of knowledge, which the Buddhist philosopher has gone into. This is called the epistemology if in the philosophical terms, but we will not go into that. What is the nature of knowing? How do we know something? Isn't it? How do we believe something? So there are a lot of theories. People believe that there were the Vedic philosophers who taught, told that whatever is written in the Vedas is true. The Buddhists said, no, it's not. You know, there is there has to be a pratyaksha praman, direct evidence for that, or there has to be the inferential inferential thinking. You got it? What I'm saying? Yes, 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 yes. Yes. So we have to know, we have to enter into the entire domain of the process of knowing what knowing really is. Okay. So the Buddha said, whatever is out there is always mediated by your six senses. Mm -hmm. Whatever there is. So for example, just to give an example of the so-called electromagnetic spectrum. Okay. Our eyes are only limited to experience the vibgore part of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. We cannot, we cannot sense the X-rays part of it. 
or the ultraviolet rays part of it. You see what I'm saying? Or the radio frequencies of it. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, those so are light. Kind of uh, we can we can uh, uh, hear only 20 dB to uh, 2000 uh, dB, and beyond that, uh, that, those sounds are not audible to us. That's true. Although but true. All, although they are present. Yes. But through the maybe the improved, uh, you know, improved uh, instruments, you can you can know, you can know even at the level of the atom what's happening there. So that's the infer inferential thinking, isn't it? Based on the evidences. Okay, sir. Okay, so what what the uh, what Baba Sambedkar is saying effectively in the verse number eleven, if we read it carefully, and I'm going to read it again. He said that at one and the same time, what the Buddha, what 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 the, what what Baba Zambit puts it here? He said that at one and the same time, no one can know and see everything. Yes. Very profound. Knowledge is never final. There is always something more to be known. Even for the Buddha, there is always new experiences which are unfolding. The Buddha doesn't mean that he has attained to some kind of a plateaued mental state where everything is stopped. Yeah, beautiful. The Buddha experienced the same word that we experience, except that the Buddha has no craving for the world. And therefore, the Buddha doesn't suffer. I'm putting it very simply, but you can get the gist of what I'm saying. Yeah, great, great, sir. Perfect. Now I have got it. Okay, there will not be emergence of Raga, Dosa, Moha in the mind of the Buddha when the Buddha's senses encounter with the world. But when you look at ourselves, our minds are all the time craving after some senses, some sensuality, some, uh, some identity, some non-identity. We All the time we are craving. All the time our minds are running hither and hither, seeking pleasure. Yes. All the time we are creating this self me, mine, I. All the time we are putting ourselves at the center of everything. All the time we are creating the world the way we want it to be. Do you see what I'm trying to get it at? Right, sir. Right, sir. Uh, and and I, I, I got uh, something more uh, from your these, these all things, uh, it proves that whatever uh, um, uh, means a person uh, means in, in buddhism it, it's all uh, uh, with the human efforts only mm -hmm. and and it, it has certain limit of individual mm -hmm. but the the unknown part is still remain to be known mm -hmm. but what is there to be known to eradicate the suffering can be known uh, sir uh, pardon please uh, what is there to be known to eradicate the suffering can be known. Uh, yeah. Okay, that so, knowledge, that the knowledge of the Buddha, the science of the Buddha is available to us. Yes, yes. Sadhu, sadhu. Thank you so much. Uh, Mangeshi, ah, uh, actually, uh, the science is so vast and it's so much in the details, and hmm. there are so many branches, different branches, and uh, different uh, theories are there. So it is not to learn everything in this one life and yes. a physical individual. Yes. So, uh, so instead of going into the depth of what has happened and how it has happened, hmm. it is better to concentrate on what is happening and yes. try to improve the presence to improve the future. Uh, that's what I what I have understood out of this. That's true. That is true. So instead of uh, worrying about future or instead of blaming the past, we can see how we can use the present to awaken ourselves. As Baba Sambedkar said that every moment offers us an opportunity to be free. Very true, very true. So anything else? Anything from uh, anybody? I'll come up. Yeah, ignorance uh, causes suffering. Yes. So, 
in pre, uh, present moment means at one and same time uh, although we have six senses but uh, our uh, mind is uh, uh, only one so at one uh, time only uh, one thing we can focus on and it cannot see everything at one and same time you got it so so it uh, causes ignorance sometimes yeah, right. because of his ignorance uh, his consciousness and uh, suffering causes yeah, yeah. Right. because the characteristic of the mind is to hold on to one object at a time yeah but it happens so fast that we we yeah. feel that you know the whole entire concept but the mind has a capacity to only hold it can only be, be aware of one object at one time at one yeah okay. mind of the sense organ and uh, subject these three things has to be um, in contact at one particular moment yes yes yes, yes. so whatever concepts or whatever theories are there in buddhism they are called the mental proliferation prapancha chitta sikha prapancha prapancha prapanchiti prapancha means Papancha. mental proliferation you know we we speculate and we create this whole sort of the theories around around the realities But is it a right way to on or the phrase I'm just uh, going to say is ki we should know everything about something and something about everything. Now even that is a way of a way of saying Umesh Bhai. Yes, sir. Because knowing everything means what? Means uh, knowing everything about something. Now what is something? Something means just just uh, we are uh, uh, on six senses. If we master the six senses yes. and it's everything. Uh, know about everything about the six senses and something about related to those means that beyond unknown that no, that we, limit we, we have to know everything about these senses because from that is where the buddha begins buddha doesn't begin with the extra sensory reality right for example if you ask the so called uh, vedantist if you ask them what is this they will say niti niti not this, not this. The Buddha will say, they will say that it's beyond the senses. Yeah. The Buddha will say, no, the reality is happening between the very moment of sensation. Great. And the Buddha will encourage us to, you know, study our senses. And this, 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 this makes the difference between them and us. This makes a hell lot of a difference between <laughs> them and us. Yes, sir. true, sir. <laughs> uh, I think uh, we have to be very attentive and gain maximum knowledge uh, to avoid uh, ignorance. Yes. That's thing. But in Buddhism, avidya is about the knowledge of the Four Noble Truths. Please don't uh, underestimate the power of the Four Noble Truths. The, the important Four Noble Truths are the thing which are very important. Everything is depend on that. Our yes. suffering. Uh, whatever like, that, uh, happen. that's a beautiful framework that the Buddha gave and, and today's lesson also we, have, we should not ignore knowledge is not never final yes and therefore we should be very humble <laughs> yes sir we should not we should have right view right view yes very true very true so right view right. is the key key to remove avijja yes see there is a lot you know, in this is these are just classes we are just discussing, and you know, this is a lifelong study. This is not just for you know when we study today and forget tomorrow. It's a lifelong quest to understand and to know more about ourselves, to remove our suffering, to work on our sufferings. But these lectures are really a motivating lectures, and uh, which are uh, giving us a lot of knowledge, which we must have ignored if this lecture is. Right, right, right. And thank you, Sunanda, madam. So, uh, should we conclude here for today? Sir, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much yes. for joining in today, and I will post it.